John Martin, Director of Inward Investment and Higher Education Academic Relationships at Walton Forest. I've been there since September 2015 and thoroughly enjoyed my time, been through a number of roles, even in that one department. From Ackroyd Lowry, I'm Oliver Lowry. And I'm John Ackroyd. And this is Urban Forecast, the show where we talk to the people defining the future of our cities. We discuss their backgrounds, what drives them, and the insights they've learned along the way. This is a podcast for anyone who's interested in how we live, work or play in the cities of the future, and what that means for the built environment today. So Jonathan, thank you so much for coming into the studio today and for being on the podcast. We've obviously met several times on your magnificent bus tour that you do around Waterford Forest, as well as many events and some really interesting meetings about opportunities that we're working on in, in the borough. But I, I wonder if you, if you would like to start explaining how you got into the role that you're in at the moment, what led you into doing this incredible role? Yes, yeah, so a really interesting point to reflect on because of my journey. So I've been recently meeting a number of quantity surveyors, and that's how I started in the whole industry. I started as a trainee quantity surveyor a little while ago, and then from there became an assistant quantity surveyor, a quantity surveyor qualified through the RICS process by getting a degree. So I've got a degree in surveying, got full RICS membership. And then a number of opportunities came forward that changed that quantity surveying focus. And the biggest significant change was I was working for an organisation called English Partnerships. And one of the directors there said, you've got a lot of quantity surveying expertise, but you also get involved in a lot broader uh, work within that department. What did English Partnerships do then? So English Partnerships were a, I suppose you call them a quango, yeah. um, but they're also a non, NGPB, non-departmental public body. And they essentially were buying, selling and developing government-owned land. So we had a massive corporate estate, and it's still going, yeah, in terms of Homes England. Okay, so, so that's, what college, sort of that's what Homes England eventually became. Yeah. Yes. They've still got a lot of that land portfolio, yeah. and lots of skills around acquisition, purchase, developing, selling sites, and also doing joint ventures. Yeah. So I was in at the outset of that, and the particular board director said it would be really good if you thought about expanding your role through a number of opportunities that were coming up, which I didn't see myself doing because yeah. I didn't see myself in those roles and decided to go for it, got the role. And essentially then that opened up that wider real estate opportunity, which I really liked. Yeah. Far less streamed than just one sector. From that, I then got opportunities to work in Milton Keynes, which, which was fantastic. Different part of the country from London. And what role were you doing there? S- similar to the so again, general. it was a very similar iteration of the kind of English partnerships role. And it was all around land development. So my role was land manager. But within that, I had a portfolio of about 800 and something hectares of land, 825 hectares of land across the southeast, the wider southeast. So pretty much from Peterborough all the way down to Crawley, because it also picked up some of the legacy from community, the commission of Newtown. Yeah. So there used to be 21, new, there are 21 new towns. Yeah. And at that time, we were working largely focused on those areas. So, not was that, so were you bringing in sort of private developers to partner with the sort of the land ownership then? Or was it just done purely by the council? It depended where you were. And we worked alongside the council. So we weren't the council in other parts of the country. In Milton Keynes, the, essentially the Commission for New Towns and English Partnership had planning powers, 7-1 and 7-2 planning powers. So they could grant planning on sites, yeah. which was really good because essentially we could control what came forward. Yeah. So we would bring in third party developers to build on sites that they would buy of us. Yeah. So we were thoroughly engaged in that and then walk through the planning with them as well. So it was a kind of a virtuous circle of cradle to grave as a design concept went pretty much from designing it, giving the planning, then seeing the thing get built. And was that, what, were they typically house builders, kind of Barrett Barclay types, or were they more smaller local? It was a, bit again, a really good mix on the other. House builders, industrialists, so lots of prologists, were there building industrial estates? Mm-hmm. There were lots of mixed use development as well in terms of commercial floor space alongside with offices, but alongside housing coming forward. So that was a big focus on how we were looking to, for example, build up Milton Keynes at the time. And what was it that what was it that started to appeal to you at that point that was drawing you away from the quantity surveying? Was it, was it that you really enjoyed this kind of partnering, or was it 
you enjoyed this big sort of strategic role versus the micro. And I think sometimes QSing is quite, you have to look at everything quite close up, don't you? <laughs> With, you know, what was the thing that was yeah. drawing you that, yeah. in that direction? It's a great ground in terms of understanding the technical side of how you deliver schemes and cost consultancy and so forth. So enormous respect for that industry and that sector. What drew me into that wider, broader focus was really around the sort of partnership working. I love working with people. I also like being able to see a scheme from an earlier concept stage as well, yeah. which was really important for me. So with QS, and you might get to be involved once you've got to a certain part of the yeah. development process. When you get into that wider is where you are upstream looking at the early designs, yeah. I could be involved in that as well and go all the way through to delivery on site. Yeah. Post well, you're probably getting in even earlier than us, really, because kind of identifying parts right. yes. of the land that are going to be able to be brought that's, forward. That's, what that's the bit really I think really actually we as architects kind of almost miss out on. And it's part of the reason that I think we quite enjoy working with boroughs like yourselves that have got quite an open attitude towards saying that this is the direction that we want to go in. And actually, you, I do think they do a great job of bringing people in on a sort of vision stage of a project before it's even before it's even drawn it's like this is the aspiration the vision for the borough and bringing people into that into rooms where you can talk about that i think is really fascinating for us to we actually get to see almost a bit before we're involved <laughs> that's a really core cool part of what we deliver at Walton forest and what's certainly drawn me to that borough is that early engagement the endorsement we've got from the leadership and senior management all the way throughout uh, my time there as part of Invest Waltham Forest. And that role and that particular engagement with people at the outset, to start to talk about the whole proof of concept, the scoping, that initial feasibility work is interesting mm. because you can see how you can shape things. You remember where it starts and then how it may stop transition. And that's, again, really infusing because you know you're making a difference when you're talking to people. So if I take you back to Milton Keynes, sorry, I jumped ahead. How long were you there and did you, what, were you then headhunted out of uh, to, into Wilson Forest? I was at Milton Keynes for about four and a half years. I only enjoyed my time there. saw the place change before the theatre district came along, before the snow demo, as, as it was called at the time. And all the major sort of development was still in the offing and in the pipeline. So it was helping that come forward with bringing the best developers and investors. And then an opportunity came up in London to get back down to London with English Partnership working for the South East team. And that effectively picked up parts of London and East London, which I was really quite enthused to get involved with again. Thoroughly enjoyed my time there, ended up working at, at Harbour Exchange as part of English Partnerships. And again, there was lots of work we were doing with developers, investors, contractors to bring forward schemes, more sort of East London and South East London focused. Mm -hmm. So that was really quite important. And also working out towards part of the sort of South East and North of Kent. So North Kent and South East of Essex, which was part of my role as well. So that was a really interesting kind of reflection between what some boroughs were doing outside of London. Yeah. With London as a major focus because that's where a lot of their kind of linkages were yeah. and what, how we were doing that recently. What were the, are there any sort of major kind of landmark projects from that period of time that you now go back to and go, ah, this is, this came from my inception? Yeah, I was really pleased, I was discussing this just last night at an event where we were really pleased to be involved in some work in Basildon. Mm -hmm. And one of the schemes was about how we could bring forward a change in some of the retail that was there. And so I was really pleased with that scheme in terms of how we had a freehold ownership we were able to work with the incoming retailer and negotiate a position where we could essentially get them into that, that ownership through a transaction and a sale. And we had to operate, and this is what I really was infused about this particular project at such pace. Uh, we had to do a deal pretty much from seeing the transaction to getting the deal done in about four months. And that includes all the governance. Yeah. all the risk mitigation, all the governance papers and the approvals, and then actually doing the transaction. So I remember the board director at the time saying it shows that we can keep pace with the commercial sector. Yeah. And I think that's something I've always kept as one of those kind of guiding principles, which is you've got to react swiftly yeah. and make sure that the kind of industrial sector, the commercial sector, the residential sector, see you as able to operate at the same speed. Yeah. 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 Because that's where the money comes in terms of the cost of money. They can yeah. be doing something else with it. Yeah. We'd rather than do it with us yeah. if we're talking about Walton Forest. So that was really quite uh, instrumental in shaping my thoughts on how I engage with the private sector. Yeah. And I've been fortunate to work with great colleagues that largely have had that kind of approach as well. 
So as you'll know from working walking the forest, you generally get people pushing all in the same direction to get to that overall Absolutely. end result. Got the dream team there, at the, at the, with, the, with the team that they've assembled at Walton Forest, we I think most, most boroughs would be very envious of that mm-hmm. sort of senior level of officers and, and politicians. What are we now at the point where you migrate to Walton Forest? Was that through the English partnership still? So from English partnerships, I then left and went to Croydon and spent about three years at Croydon. So that was really enjoyable as well, just in terms of getting back into sort of local authority. And that was the real first time I got into understanding in a contemporary context, the machinations of working in local authority, the accountability, the, the pace. Great, did you get, did you suddenly find it, everything might look slower? It was certainly more challenging in terms of the governance and the accountability that you have yeah. to have. So you've got to go through transparent approach to why you're doing something, how you're bringing people along as yeah. well. So far more around the consultation, which was yeah. really important, obviously, going forward. So that was quite an interesting incident for me. And then I got the phone call. I'm and going to stop you there because I really want to ask, yeah. given the troubles that Croydon have had over the past couple of years, obviously, uh, first of all, not 60 bricks, what's that one called? Brick by bricks. Brick by bricks. Sorry, yeah. 60 bricks is what I was That's fine. That obviously got into trouble and had to be bought out yeah. and then I think the, the administration itself effectively ran out of money mm-hmm. was there I don't know maybe you won't be able to say but were there signs in the kind of governance or the way it was being run at the time where you were there maybe over ambition trying to emulate the private sector were there signs that you were reading that when you saw that happen subsequently you went yeah that kind of makes sense not when I was there because I left just as the sort of political leadership had changed yeah so things were still being shaped and crafted in terms of what the new administration wanted to do and i was in the regeneration department completing existing schemes or going forward with existing schemes so i was then at the point that i was asked to come and talk to wolf and forest mm-hmm. and go through the sort of rigorous hiring process that they have there and so when i joined there was still no inclination that anything was going to happen at croydon yeah so i'd still be in contact with my old colleagues and it was all it's changing because people are taking opportunities but i wasn't cited on any of what opportunities yeah. come forward since then it was a real shame because actually i think that the what they were doing at brick by brick mm-hmm. they assembled really great design teams they were ambitious and they were doing i think what b first and 60 bricks mm. are doing now pretty effectively which is delivering a return to yes. the local authority and delivering homes for people that live in the borough it's a real shame that one went so badly wrong and i don't know enough about why but i, I think this new arm's length developer aligned to, to the borough using the borough's borrowing facilities effectively yes. and their ability to borrow cheaply yeah. is a really great way to deliver housing in it because at the moment it's a lot of private developers are finding it very challenging to deliver homes and actually yeah. they need local authorities to be assisting them where they can. Yeah, it's, it's a shame that it didn't work out so well in Croydon. Yeah, and again, perfect example of I wasn't at Croydon when Brick by Brick was set up. Mm. So that all came along after I'd already left the council. So I was looking on with interest in terms of that's a new way to deliver housing, it's a new vehicle that the council supporting and then watched it from that kind of, I used to be involved in that council. Yeah. So again, similar to yourself, it's just sad to see the way that things transpired. Yeah. But it was past my tenureship there. I've been observing it pretty much as everyone else has really in terms of what's transpired since then. And then first, so were you, did you, did Stuart Murray, was it, were you interviewing him or did he come after you? So Stuart joined after myself. Yeah. I've had the really interesting pleasure of going through what was a rigorous in, in interview process and, and who were you interviewing with them was it the so i went yeah, i was uh, and it's funny enough i was interviewed by who is now the deputy leader councillor Asan khan okay so he was on my interview panel pretty much like this yeah um, and that <laughs> was the final interview yeah. i had yeah and obviously now i'm working for councillor khan he's the deputy leader looking at uh, housing and regeneration yeah so yeah, uh, great full so circle. that's a fantastic full circle you think yeah. i don't have that happen often in your life yeah uh, i've really warmed to the opportunity to do that and he's come along to a number of our investment you know so we did an investment summit back in November last year, yeah. and it's our third since obviously the pandemic kicked in. And we've been really enthused at the sort of leadership engagement with that. So our leader, Councillor Williams, was also there. Stuart Murray was there. Martin Eason's been there in the past as well. So we've had all of that mandate from the top leadership and the political leadership to endorse Invest Walking Forest and Inward Investment. Yes. So that gives me a lot of confidence and mandate to engage with the sector. I think it's worth explaining, actually, because I brought some people along to that event, and it'd just be worth explaining what those series of events are, because 
as far as I know, they are pretty unique to Wilson Forest. And I think everybody that I've ever brought, I've been to loads of them. Everyone I've always brought has been just so impressed uh, at how they're like, this borough is different to every other borough because look at what they're doing. They're, they've got everybody there, all the senior decision makers in planning and regeneration are all there saying, please come to us, understand what we need and then help us deliver it. And I, I don't, I haven't seen it in other, I think Croydon actually did used to do it. They did a tour as well, but yes, yeah, but yeah. I think you guys did it amazingly well. Do you just want to explain a bit about the thinking behind it and how those events work? Yeah, sure. And again, it's a really interesting point just around how people are rising scan. So the leadership at the time, so this would have been about 2014, looked at the borough. We'd been through the Olympics, thought we could have got more from the Olympics. Mm -hmm. We got plenty, but we wanted more in terms of physical improvements to the bar. And so they commissioned a growth commission. And that essentially was a number of learned people, including employers within Wolfram Forest, to look at the borough completely, look at various areas in terms of housing, how we were promoting ourselves as a borough in London, and a whole raft of other things that we needed to do to address the borough's ambition. And that report was published and brought forward about 26 to 28 recommendations on how we could do better in the borough. One of those was standing out in London. And how do we make Waltham Forest far more visible, far more of a presence? And that led to Invest Waltham Forest. So the cabinet at the time in 2014, 2015, but 2014 initially adopted the entire set of recommendations. Oh, wow. <laughs> and said, let's get on with it. Yeah. And through Martin Eason's leadership, who's the CEO, there was a keen drive to make that happen. So that's how we then started the focus around Invest Waltham Forest. I was then brought in 2015. We got the investor tours going. Yeah. And that was all about when we're speaking to people, what do they actually hear? So it's the old so what factor. Yeah. And everything I wanted to do was about the so what factor. So if I say something to an investor, it's there's a site coming up. So what? You could bid for it. Yeah. So how will I do that? Yeah. And it's always that answer. Or I think even the ones that aren't within your ownership, it's not just how do we bid for assets that the, the borough owns. It's more, I think certainly, look, this is a site that is, we think, can come forward. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We don't have control of it, but we know that it, this is an area where we want redevelopment and mm. therefore come talk to us if you are, if it's something that you're interested in bringing forward yourself. And I think that's, from the first time that I did the bus tour to now, there's 20-storey buildings that weren't there. Like Black Horse Road. Honestly, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a testament to that drive and ambition to get to prosperity and growth through development. And I think picking up on that point, it's all around how we can bring people to understand where the landowners are. So that investor tool was always around, here are the growth areas, here are the areas that we're looking to focus on. And whether we own the site or a third party landowner owned the site or an intermediary, the general sort of push was, this is potentially going to bring forward some much needed development and there's going to be expectations around quality, obviously. And as you said, through those kind of various investor tours, bus tours, and also the briefings, I think people get that kind of understanding that we mean what we say, which we want to yeah. support yeah, investors yeah. and developers. Yeah, and that's all developers want. I think I've said this many times on this podcast, mm. and use Wilson and Boris as an example of all developers really want is certainty all investors want is certainty exactly and yeah. there's lots of factors that are well outside of your hands that have created uncertainty at the moment inflation etc but the one thing you can control is the planning process and the ability to try and work with people and i think what is makes it easier for developers is that you're very clear about what the vision is so i think if you come to Wilson forest and you get it wrong then more for you because it's pretty clear what you guys want <laughs> and we're it's a really good observation and we are looking to always articulate and improve it and make it as straightforward as possible we're doing lots around design which is obviously very apt for our discussion particularly around how we can do exemplar design and benchmark what we want there's a whole piece around developer for performance agreements now and that actually expands out the engagement of planning to much earlier in the process and much later in the process so it's a much bigger intervention by us working with designers rather than just a PPA. So again, yeah. that's getting the message out there. I've been out to site visitors with investors, looking at sites, walking around those sites with those investors, and with my colleagues from Regen Property, Planning, Housing, and we will tell that story of what we think can come forward. Yeah. And we may not own that site, but yeah. we know that they'll be coming back to talk to the council. Yeah. So it really helps in that kind of single point conversation, that single conversation where sometimes you get a phone call and a 
we've got this interest, but we don't know who to speak to in the council. And we can triage that into the yeah, various... I was just going to speak to you. It yeah. helps, because again, I can make sure it's an efficient introduction to the borough. Yeah. But at the same time, you can then make sure the other person, the other end of that... But yeah, well, so you're the conduit, so the, you know, the relevant person, which I think is, is very handy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's nice that not every borough has a Jonathan Martin that you go to first, and he understands your need, and then tells you you need to speak to Ian Ray or you know whoever, whoever yeah, it happens to be. Thank you. We do get positive feedback. It's all about that initial impact. And again, what's been really telling about that is in my role in terms of being innovative and trying to change the borough for the better in terms of prosperity is always horizon scanning in terms of what's next. And that's why I've got the second half of my title in terms of higher education academic relationships because it's due to my introducing the University of Portsmouth yep. into the borough. So that was something, again, through a conversation at an event. And from that, there was a big discussion around, is there going to be a proof of concept here? And then we went into all sorts of very rigorous treasury standard, green book appraisal type work to establish if a university could be established there. Yeah. And a lot of that, coming back to my earlier points, was around relationship building. So working with people, but also picking up on your point earlier around what we've always said, which is certainty. So you know mm -hmm. that the leader's going to be there. So really interesting story. But again, is it's less than a year ago, actually. So I got a text on a Saturday. So I'm not sure what's my work phone on a Saturday, but I got a text from a colleague working for the university partnership. And he said, our chairman is flying in to the UK en route to Canada. And he'd like to see the top brass. And I said, okay, that's really good. That's good. So we'll have a whole partnership thing. When do you want that? And he said, Thursday. So I said, Thursday, 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 which month? And he said, Thursday, as in the Thursday coming. <laughs> so I was really, as you can imagine, taken back by this is going to involve all of the senior leadership and the political leadership in yeah. terms of attending that meeting. Yeah. For all. Can't say no to that. Yeah. So, so it better not be bullshit. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, right, how can we make this happen? Just go for it. And that Thursday, we were all sitting in the room. And I was sitting in the room, looking down the table, thinking our leaders here, deputy leader, Stuart Murray, student director, Heather Flinders. I was there. From their side, it was deputy vice chancellor, group deputy and another vice chancellor, their chief executive, their strategic global director, and their chairman in three working days. And I just stopped and looked and I thought, wow, that's going to give you a sense of this is really serious for the borough. Yeah. We take this stuff really seriously. Yeah. And as you can imagine, diaries had to be shifted and moved to make that happen. But it happened. And we then did a tour of the borough in terms of walking up to Walthamstow Central, just to show them some of the sort of landscape of where the actual university would be potentially located. And it's just occurred, that was less than a year ago. And then and fast forward to now, fast forward the scaffolding's down on that big tower, which I believe they're at the base of, is that right? Yes, yeah, so they're going to be in the ground floor and the first floor of Juniper House, and they are targeting opening that university. We've gone live with the website. We've gone live with the actual announcement last week that the admissions and recruitment centre, which is based out of our central library, is available for people to start to use in terms of the courses. Yeah. And it's going to be about outreach and raising awareness. And they'll start teaching next year. So January 2024, from a cold start yeah. in March 2020, just as lockdown kicked in, and the project was stood up with a team in January 2021. So that application must have already been presented, is that right? So there was just a commercial space at the ground floor that you went, that's where you could fit. So interestingly, there was an existing application that had been consented yeah. by the previous owners. Yeah. Um, and that was for quite a large building going on that side in terms of Central House, which is the main location for the campus site. And during the house, we were obviously building that ourselves, and that had obviously gone through planning and was on site. Yeah. So that was going to work out in terms of we were just acting in a very nimble way. Yeah, so um, you could easily sort them because you had control. Ground floor commercial university, that's yeah. going to be a really yeah. good anchor tenant for that particular location, and potentially a partnership spanning out for 50 years. Why wouldn't you do that? And then Central House, we sold to them, and again, went through all the sort of due diligence, the commercial sector, the negotiations. And again, that's now going to go through the whole planning process as well, which will take all through the wider DPS I mentioned to you. Yeah. Again, targeting opening that building by about 2027 in terms of a new campus. Teens tall in terms of the actual impact of building up to 5,000 students. And again, it's just off the pace of 
what we expect as a borough. And you get that from the leadership going yeah. right the way throughout the, the offices, basically. And because I think, yeah, you're very lucky with the leaders that you've had. Was there, so obviously Claire sit down and did that interrupt in any way the sort of momentum that you had? I know Claire was very, had a very, she was, I suppose, part of the vision, really, of bringing so many high quality people to deliver for the borough. Was there any sort of loss of momentum with Grace or did she just pick it up on a running start? It's a really interesting point because it's one of those things where you start to think what's going to happen next. Yeah. But just to give you some brief context, so Councillor Chris Robbins, no longer with us, unfortunately, so rest in peace, was visionary working with Martin Eatham around how we could do investment for Boris. And at that stage, they were really pressing that forward to start that journey. Then Claire used to be the portfolio lead member for the economic growth team and then became the leader, uh, working closely with Councillor Chris Robbins. And then obviously, right. said Claire stepped down and obviously Councillor Williams came in and she's been a breath of fresh air in terms of how we do the engagement in a far more articulate way. Yep. So explaining the benefits of growth, explaining prosperity. So to the again, residents about because obviously actually a lot of what you've been doing is to explain it to investors and it's her approach that you need to also bring the borough and the residents with you as well. It's a better articulation of how we explain why we're doing what yeah. we're doing with our residents. So yeah. there's a lot more co-creation. Yeah. There's a lot more around the ground up approach in terms of what's good for those communities and, the, and those locations. We do the big, the big conversation uh, and we hold those annually mm -hmm. where we listen to what they have to say. So there's that kind of real mandate to understand what people want in the borough and where they want it and what we can do about that. And then the sort of feedback we then bring into how we approach some of these growth areas and locations. So from Chris to Claire to Grace, has been seamless in terms of that embracing growth. And yeah. that's been something that you wouldn't expect to see. As if you had to worry about risk, one of yeah, the biggest yeah. risks is, oh, the leader's going to change. Yeah, exactly. We've not had any of that impact. Yeah. Anything we've been doing in terms of our sort of growth agenda and prosperity yeah. agenda. And that's something that I think is, again, really comforting when you're talking to developers. I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm, where do you sit now on development? So yeah, why actually... Look at what happens in one to left. Yeah. Even even the change of leadership really did change the outlook if you're a developer looking to work in that borough. And I, I think that is a big risk, um, particularly at one to as an example. And I think because it's been seen as a risk, we're looking at how we can mitigate risk for our development sector. And that's one of them yeah. in terms of consistent leadership, but also the certainty and also making sure that whole message is continually promoted to the centre. Yeah. And I think actually also you've really got, I suppose, what Water Bros have done is that you split off it's not directly, you don't go to Councillor Williams, you go to Stuart Murray. And that's a department in and of itself, whereas I think at ones where Rav, you used to be somebody that would really be quite involved in some of the developments coming forward. And I think actually, if you split it out, like you've done, then a change of leadership doesn't necessarily affect that team. It's such a strong team that you've got with Justin, Stuart, yourself. Yeah, so you know, I've been really blessed with working with fantastic colleagues. So the other thing about what I do in terms of the investment and promotion the borough is you give it all this to sometimes strangers who don't know you yeah. uh, and you can back it up. So they might think he's giving it all this. Yeah. But actually, when they then come and see the borough and they meet some of my colleagues, yeah. they're like, wow, okay, this is a really serious borough. And then the real decision is around how they engage in yeah. terms with my colleagues. And that's where I'm pleased to say they get that consistent professionalism and that can-do attitude on how we can bring stuff forward. So that, for me, makes it a far easier position to talk to, as I did last night, an international bank about potentially looking at funding potential schemes coming forward in Waltham Forest with the certainty that I know. Yeah. When they come and see me next month or later this month, I'll have the team ready to say, look, this is what we've done. Yeah. On our own land, but also working in partnership with others to give that sort of track record and that credibility of choice to the partner as well. So. Yeah, the, the town hall is a great exemplar. Of, uh, I remember when I first, I live in Waltham Forest, so slightly, slightly well, biased, but uh, yeah. I remember first going to Waltham Forest and that the town hall was, it looked like something out of the sort of communist era of like Italian fascism. It was very grand, but it was also behind these massive gates. And I remember cycling past it for the first time, what? I wonder what that is. I remember cycling past the, the council and looking at it and thinking it looked slightly terrifying and certainly very unwelcoming. Whereas when you go there now, I think the fountain you put there is amazing. When you go into the building, it, it's fantastic. That plus the borough of culture, were they like 2014, they were set as strategic goals as part of that idea that you needed to bring attention to what you were doing in the borough? 
So again, a really good question just around what was the sort of genesis of those fantastic end results. Bar of Culture wasn't set from 2014. That was something that came along through obviously the mayor's office. And the changes around the town hall, very similar. It's all been agile, looking at what the needs are of, of the local community. What's been really quite important about the Borough of Culture, though, and being London's first Borough of Culture, was the endorsement it gave of how we've engaged with our communities. We had between 14 and 16,000 volunteer supporters for our bid, which I think was the largest of the boroughs that actually took part in that competition. And I think there were about 20 of the boroughs that had gone for that first, that first Borough of Culture program so we were pleased to get it in 2019 it then really led to knowing our communities so much better the network of networks we worked with a number of partnerships around understanding how you get that sort of ground up approach to culture we had our own bidding processes where local communities could bid for themselves in terms of cultural ideas that could be promoted and they'd be peer reviewed and if they were successful, then they'd then get funding to support those events. Over a thousand events, every school touched by Borough of Culture. We had hero events as well that came along. And it was just transformational in terms of what the borough has been about for a long time in terms of that cultural offer. But leading into the sort of changes, we then saw that we could take that further forward. Again, as say we got was MJ's Local Authority of the Year in 2019 as well. So we seen in a really high bar there. And I think that gave us the confidence to look at what could we do with the town hall yeah, and transformed it into what you say and have seen it is now. For us as staff working in it, it's amazing when you're sitting there, the windows are open, you can hear the music outside, you can hear mm-hmm. children playing, adults talking and that hustle and bustle of people yeah. enjoying themselves in that fellowship square. Yeah. So it's really transformed what was a really austere, you better have a really good reason to go through those gates yeah to go to that. the town hall whereas now it's there are signs saying this is your space come in yeah and you'll get people particularly moving into the spring and summer using that space for all sorts of things loads of events are going on there as well so that's been really transformational and as a sort of staff member seeing it you just think, look at the sort of vision you have to look at it isn't fixed in this yeah. particular form you yeah. can change it yeah, yeah. and it can be more engaging. And we're doing a similar thing down at Combination Square in Leighton. So that's a scheme that's being brought forward through Taylor Wimpey. And we'll similarly have a scheme. Oh, next to Leighton, are That's it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 So again, it's going to be a transformational urban extension down in Leighton. Yeah. And it's how we can build off those lessons learned. So we are literally, if you go to, the, for example, our housing zone and look at the earlier phases of the housing zone to the later phases of the housing zone, you can see the the changes and the improvements and the lessons learned yeah. in terms of the built form and how we are doing things in terms of making sure we don't lose those those experiences as we improve with people living there and using those spaces. So it's been just eye-opening. And again, that happened during the pandemic. We kept stuff going because we had to make sure we could protect jobs, but give that market to the industry. We mainly what we say, we're going to keep building. Yeah. We're going to keep building. Nice to also to come back. I think a lot of officers have struggled to actually get staff back in. So we did all this work to this office during COVID as well. And actually, yeah, nice, fantastic. once it's finished, getting yeah. people back in and going, look, it's better now. And yeah. It's a bit of a draw if you can have a, a nice space for people to work in to actually get them to come back into work. So is it working well? Have you got high occupancy rates in, of your staff or is it still split work from home? Yeah, we're still using a hybrid approach. So it's about two or three days a week expected in the office. Yeah. Being very flexible about that flexible working. And again, it's got to do with the exigencies of the service. So if you're frontline staff, you've got to be in because you're meeting with the public on a regular basis. Yeah. If you're doing other roles, then there may be a bit more flexibility about it. What we're really keen to support, though, is that sort of collaborative feel to any of our sort of teams. So we have different neighbourhoods as we badge them within Fellowship Square Town Hall. And within those neighbourhoods, you've got different teams. No particular desks are ruled out for anyone. So you can sit anywhere you want. But there is that neighbourhood that may be focused around regeneration. Yeah. There may be that around planning. There may be that around housing, 60 bricks and so forth. So yeah, I think from that kind of focus, the reflection has been, how do you improve? And really quite telling, given what we've just been through as a planner, how do you reflect on the personal journey? How do people feel about going into Fellowship Square? What's the experience as a staff member, as a user? How can we open that up to the community? So there are horrible spaces there as well. We're doing lots of civic things there. People get married there. And we're looking at how we can also improve some of the other buildings and assets around it. So the assembly halls will come back into its full use. 
and that's obviously a big cultural asset for us. Big push, obviously, from the borough culture in terms of making sure we can evidence our cultural mm. legacy. Soho Theatre, uh, which is being built at the moment through, again, the change from END, EMD cinema. And we'll be soft launching that later this year with the hard launch next year. And that's going to form part of our cultural centre, that cultural quarter for us. So we're really excited about that. And that will sit beside our university quarter and that will sit beside the work that's going on over at Fellowship Square with the work around the new community that's going to go There's a lot of work on that we're excited to get done this year. <laughs> Every time I go past it, I'm like, it says coming 2023, and I yeah. think, hurry up then. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. It's a soft launch and then yeah. a hard launch, but again, no, it's, it's a little bit of partners. It looks like it's made some big steps forward. Really. Now the audience come down yeah, and start yeah. to see that facade yeah, as well. It's really, it's really wow. You know, and you've got Soho Theatre as the operator, so you know, you've know you got a quality operator that's going to really drive that for us and secure the acts that we want to, to bring into the borough and make the borough a pull. That's the other thing that when you mentioned what brought you to the borough, when I used to be there in the early part of my tenure there, people would say, oh, we ended up here because we were pushed out elsewhere. And I said, we've got to change that narrative and start to pull people in. And I think we're there more now in terms of people don't just talk about us as a, that's an overflow to somewhere else. Yeah. It's actually, that's a really good place to be. Yeah. Because people are sensible. You've got clear lines of what you can achieve and you can see existing people that are there as advocates. We'll say, yeah. we came here, we set up business it's been very straightforward if we've had issues it's been dealt with and we've had to then work together to get those end results we all want yeah i think that comes across so i've got two final questions yeah the first one is what's next i think you must be coming not well for you personally and also for the borough you must be coming through almost up to the 10-year plan of if it started in 2014 mm-hmm. this is coming up to 2024 is there another, what happens after the end of that kind of 10 year plan? And then the same for you personally, is there another challenge in a borough where your work here is done, so you move on or are you gonna stick with Wilson Forest? You probably don't have to answer Yeah, interesting question. <laughs> I'll think about the second question, but I'll certainly give you a take on the first question because we've had a number of sort of corporate documents, our corporate strategies over that period. So the 2014 document wasn't necessarily spanning it over a 10 year period. It was more of, you need to look at these particular pillars of improvement. And within that, you get to your 26 or 28 recommendations. But over that time, we had a number of corporate strategies. And we're now into our next iteration of corporate strategy, which is all around how we can support people to meet their maximum potential, how we can do a big piece around jobs, helping people back into jobs, safe, safe and healthy lives. And how we can make sure we bring people along in terms of that co-creation of us. That's massively important for us. So it's a big thing around everyone being involved in the sort of future of the borough. We're going through our local plan processes as it takes up to about 2036, 2037. And lots of targets in there around making sure we can deal with the homes and the jobs, which is really key. Big focus around the sort of jobs, climate emergency. We've got a 2030 challenge to get to net zero carbon and again that was through our sort of climate emergency that we declared a few years ago now and it's just around what else can we do to really move the borough into an area of prosperity one of the big things we've looked at is the whole issue around health inequality which is noticeable across the borough and so we've used the marla institute professor the marla has come in, looked at what the borough's been doing, looked at where it can go, looked at what some of our interventions may be, and we're working through that now to see how we can really make a difference to our most vulnerable, but also the wider population as well. So that's quite challenging. Yeah, um, and you're going to be same. building a new hospital at Whips Whip Cross as well. And obviously we're looking at Whips and how we can bring that forward, <laughs> a major anchor institution for us. So we're an anchor institution, they're an anchor institution, and obviously University of Portsmouth is an incoming anchor institution. Yeah. So to get three anchor institutions, in one borough looking to transform at the same time has got to be a one-off so it's really infusing to be in that discussion yeah so in terms of what's next for us it's around how can we start to future proof the roles for the potential jobs that are coming forward for our residents mm-hmm. and a lot of that has been on the back of finding out that we had a about 45 percent risk of our residents being at risk of losing jobs or changing jobs through automation so how can we address that university coming in with what they'll bring in terms of research and development and so forth, knowledge transfer will have a big part of that. We've got jobs academies, as well as you can imagine, only that's responding to the impact of the pandemic. And there's also that middle tier of people partway through their careers, maybe a bit older in terms of their career path that could potentially transfer. So how can we work with them? 
to give them more job opportunities. So from the council side, that's really quite big. From the sort of my professional side, it's always about growth. So what's next? I'm looking at how we can use universities as a catalyst to deliver some more things which I'll share in the coming months. Though, and it's around, again, changing the ambition. And that's a big thing where a few years ago, people may have thought you'd never get a university here because you haven't got one. There are other universities literally just over the border in other boroughs. And now we've got one. Yeah. And it's how we can really use that to leverage, yeah. not just raising our expectations for our residents, but raising their expectations and how they can fit into a wider offer for London as well and really position the borough to be a real anchor as part of that kind of upper league valley. So it's uh, it's really significant and the sky's the limit, basically. So it keeps me keeps me enthused and keeps me thinking. Good politician's answer <laughs> about, about your future. But no, I think it's perfect time to wrap it up. And just thank you so much. It's been great working with you and uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much for the invitation, I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed the show, then please subscribe and give us a review, ideally a five-star one. And if you want to know more, please go to ackroydlowry.com or follow us on Twitter at ackroydlowry and Instagram with the same. This podcast supports LandAid, the property industry charity that brings together the sector to deliver life-changing projects for young people who really need it. Visit www.landaid.org to find out how you can help end youth homelessness.